Hello, good evening. Welcome to Look North. Tributes have been paid across our region today to the Duke of Edinburgh, who died this morning at the age of 99. The Duke visited Yorkshire many times over the years, both privately and for public engagements. He touched many aspects of life here, whether encouraging young people to test their sense of adventure through the Duke of Edinburgh's award scheme or meeting fellow veterans of the Second World War. Those who met him remember a man with a keen interest in many different fields and a quick and sharp sense of humour. Cathy Killick looks back at his long association with our part of the world. We now pay particular attention because we're going to see the world's most experienced pluck on <laughs> Ready with a joke, this was the Duke's last public visit to Yorkshire in 2015 to a police training centre in Wakefield. Just one visit among hundreds over the years. He became the Duke of Edinburgh in 1947, and from the very start, Prince Philip has played his part in the royal family, most familiarly a respectful few paces behind the Queen. As consort, he strove to support in the background, always recognising it was the Queen who was the main attraction. But the strength of his personality was never far below the surface. He enjoyed a joke, even if sometimes it was on him, and was dismayed if off-the-cuff comments became gaffes. Over the years, his visits to Yorkshire have seen him trying to meet as many ordinary people as possible. This visit to Chapeltown in Leeds in 1990 proving one of dozens to the region. When they visited uh, York Minster, uh, for the, it was a millennium service. There was a walkabout uh, on a wide street between the Minster and the assembly rooms. And the Queen went down one side and the Duke the other. And it, it was quite clear that the people on the Duke's side were a bit disappointed that the Queen wasn't on their side. And there were a lot of young people, three, four, five, six-year-olds, with little posies of flowers. And the Duke uh, uh, lifted them over the barrier, and he was then around 80, lifted them over the barrier and said, now go and give your flowers to the Queen. And of course, that was the most brilliant thing to have done. As consort, the Duke was able to go where perhaps the Queen couldn't. In 1989, he went underground at the Selby Coalfield, emerging dusty with the miners and impressed with how hard they worked. 13 years later, and a sign of the times, he presided over Cap House Colliery opening as a museum. I remember going down several working pits in the early days. It's extraordinary to think that, that a, a, an industry, what, 40 years ago, which was such an important part of the, of the British economy, is, is suddenly become a museum piece. Military links with the region were also important to the Duke, he was a naval officer before he married and served in the Far East. As patron of the Burma Star Association, he enjoyed reliving the camaraderie of those days, as these veterans from Scarborough remembered in 1996. He was a typical naval officer. Yeah. I mean, uh, I mean uh, look at that there with, with the guitar. Yeah. and He's really enjoying himself there, isn't he? Well, it would have been grand if we'd known about him being able to play the guitar. He could have given us a turn at the Royal Army. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But he was, he was a very popular officer when he was actually a serving lieutenant. Well, that, that actually was a Christmas pudding mixture when yes, they poured the some in it. Oh, yeah, the, oh yes, he was the one that poured the rum in. Oh, yeah. He was either the skipper or the guest of honour. Yeah. Oh, in that case. We all got to lick the spoon after. <laughs> the holders of the Burma and Pacific Stars form a sort of secret society. And it is this feeling of comradeship born of the shared experience of adversity and success far from home that has motivated this association and kept this reunion going for so many years. And I think we would all agree that this comradeship was greatly enhanced by the extraordinary team spirit that developed throughout every rank and unit of Southeast Asia Command and in the British Pacific Fleet. In 1998, a visit to Knaresborough found Prince Philip exchanging banter at a working men's club. <laughs> Normally start drinking quite as early as this. No, I just, I just, I just, I just, I just a special occasion. 
Yorkshire. Well, here's another book. He was in search Just of the real Yorkshire and found it in a translation of an Ilkley Moor Bartat. The story of the song, complete with translation into the Queen's English for the benefit of off Comdens. <laughs> But he was equally at home on the big occasions, as when Royal Ascot came to York in 2005. The spectacle gave the city a great boost, and the royal couple were pleased to return to Yorkshire for the 150th Great Yorkshire Show in 2008. The Duke had his own itinerary, but the organisers hadn't reckoned on an 87-year-old getting round it at such a cracking pace. It was 20 minutes ahead of schedule, uh, and in, in fact I missed my slot, because I was stood at my appointed place 10 minutes before, and when I got there someone said, oh, they've gone. So I had to run down the avenue, get through the security, and then I was introduced. I was supposed to meet you further back, but you were, you were ahead of schedule. I then went on to one or two stands with him where people were ma mainly uh, English manufacturers, which is very interesting in that. Uh, he was interested in the prices, all of which seemed to be too expensive. I think he'll be remembered as being a, a very good consort, really. I think he's done an excellent job for such a long time. Um, and not, not many people will be able to do that job for that length of time. And for a man of, uh, as he was then, of 87, he was very, very, very aware of things and, and, and very knowledgeable. Very kind, very thoughtful. Wonderful company, wonderful to be with. Extraordinarily clever and intelligent and always... He loved an interesting conversation. So he wasn't at all bland as a person to meet. I mean, he was... Uh, you really had an interesting, stimulating time whenever you were with him. Some lovely moments there. Cathy Killick looking back at Prince Philip's association with our region. Well, across the region, tributes have been paid to the Duke today. At three o'clock this afternoon, the bell at York Minster tolled 99 times to mark the Duke's 99 years. <laughs> A special service has also taken place this afternoon. Our reporter Phil Bodmer is inside the Minster for us tonight. Phil, just sum up what the atmosphere has been like in there today. Well, Amy, the Minster is nothing if not a celebration of life, but it's also a place of reflection and contemplation too. And as news began to emerge of the uh, passing of the Duke of Edinburgh today, people began to gather here uh, to mourn his loss. This is what someone had to tell us a little earlier on. Very sad for the Queen and his family. Such um, a sad time for it to happen because everything's already quite sad. So. Obviously, he'd been with the Queen for like seven, over 70 years and I just felt, yeah, just sad for them, really. But I think um, I was surprised because obviously he, when he'd come out of hospital a few weeks ago, I assumed that everything was OK, so I just didn't expect it, I suppose. We just saw it this morning, we just heard the news and we feel very sorry and we feel very sorry for the family as well. And may he rest in peace. Well, earlier on this evening, the minister held uh, an evening prayer service where people could come in and uh, pay their respects and uh, have time to reflect. Joining us now is the Archbishop of York, uh, Stephen Cottrell. Um, your thoughts on the passing of Prince Philip? Well, two things. I mean, obviously, first of all, sadness and sorrow. Our hearts go out to the Queen and to the royal family because uh, for them, this is the loss of a much, much loved husband, father, grandfather. Um, bereavement is hard. It's something all of us have to face. And so that's my first thought of sorrow. Secondly, though, thanksgiving for a, a, a long life well lived um, and also uh, a life of great service. You knew him personally. What? was he like? We hear about his personality, but you got to see some of that, didn't you? Yes, I did. Obviously, I didn't know him well, but yes, I did get to know him. I had the great privilege of staying with the royal family a few years ago on the Saturday, this was in January, on the Saturday evening, uh, the Duke of Edinburgh uh, 
barbecued ste venison steaks and sausages outside. Um, we then ate them with the finest claret. Uh, the following morning, uh, I preached, and, and over lunch, he dissected my sermon <laughs> with me. You know, so this is a man, and he was well into his 90s when this happened. Uh, this, this is a man who lived life to the full, a man who was interested in life and interested in people, and as I say, a life also characterised by service. We know he was really interested in young people in particular. What do you think his legacy will be? Well, I think probably his greatest legacy, or the thing that springs to mind, is, is the Duke of Edinburgh award scheme, which, which my own children benefited from. But also that award scheme is about expanding your horizons, finding new challenges, discovering things about yourself that you didn't know, pushing yourself to the limits. Uh, these are good things, but they're also things which I think we saw in him and which we cherish. Archbishop, thank you for your time in talking to us on Look North tonight. Uh, the Minster will be open the weekend for people to come in to say prayers, but also importantly, there'll be a photograph of the Duke of Edinburgh and you can light a, light a candle or lay flowers as you wish. Subject to COVID restrictions, of course. Amy, back to you. Phil, thank you. And a lovely story there from the Archbishop of York. Flags are flying at half-mast on public buildings in honour of His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh. He was the longest-serving consort to a monarch in British history. Special services are taking place across our region and online books of condolences have also been set up. Corin Wheatley has been gauging reaction to the Duke's passing. Across the region, the Duke of Edinburgh's passing is marked. Not with crowds, people have been asked not to gather, but with quiet acts of remembrance and respect. For me, he was a remarkable man, had sometimes what I thought was the best and the worst of jobs. <laughs> um, but he, he was a character that stayed true um, to, I think, whom he was. It's sad, but, you know, he's, he's, he's led a very healthy, privileged long life. We're all thinking of his family as we would anyone else's family and it being a, served our country well. In town and city centres from Sheffield to Leeds and York flags fly at half mast. Some councils say books of condolence will be opened online. Among the tributes paid today there is genuine fondness for Prince Philip among others who've also spent years as public figures. For me I almost I'm going to be missing a, a brother I'm going to miss somebody who had this amazing sense of humour, uh, but also always standing behind the Queen, supporting her, encouraging her. And you could see, you could see it. And the number of times we've met actually tells me here is a great example of de devotion, commitment, love. My first thought is sadness, but then immediately accompanying that is um, a feeling of deep gratitude, really. Um, and thanks for a, a lifetime of duty and devotion. Devotion not just to the Queen, but also to this country. And uh, I feel that he was an inspiration to many, many people right across the world. Local leaders and politicians have sent messages of condolence and have spoken of the Duke of Edinburgh's public service, which spanned so many decades. I particularly reflect on his service during the Second World War. He stepped forward to serve in the Royal Navy under the most exceptionally difficult and challenging of circumstances. So whilst we've lost the Duke of Edinburgh today, we've also lost a veteran and we've lost another link to that generation who stepped forward, stood against fascism and helped preserve the freedoms that we enjoy today. So a very sad moment for our country. In accordance with his wishes, Prince Philip will not lie in state and the public will be asked not to attend his funeral. For now, many will be reflecting on how his death marks the end of a generation. Well, tributes to the Duke have been pouring in from people who met him during his 70 years of public service. Nick Bull met the Duke on a number of occasions, including when he presented the Queen with an unusual gift from the Royal Armouries to mark their Golden Jubilee. It was, uh, it was a wonderful and an, and an extraordinary intimate uh, moment um, when I was for extraordinary privileged to um, meet them both. Um, the opportunity arose because we at the Royal Armouries wished to uh, mark the Her Majesty's Golden Jubilee with a gift. And we had uh, created this, um, what looked like a, a large medieval hunting horn, 
uh, and uh, the uh, Lord Harwood had given us a room in the house in which we could meet with Her Majesty and the Duke, who was, of course, visiting uh, on that occasion. It was just Her Majesty, Lord Harwood, of course, and the Duke, uh, and myself, and the Master of the Armouries, Guy Wilson. And we, um, we had a, a wonderful exchange with her, uh, and she burst into life and uh, immediately turned to the Duke and said, oh, Philip, you know, can you remember we went to the opening of the museum? And then she started to read. And he had to correct her. Uh, and uh, she isn't often wrong on, on matters of this, <laughs> of this nature. Uh, and he had to say, well, I'm afraid I wasn't there, as you might recall. Uh, and then there was a lovely interchange between the pair of them, uh, which resulted in giggles and, uh, and things of that sort. It was also an occasion when we had to ask Her Majesty if we could... Uh, had keep the gift that we were giving her. And, of course, that inspired in, in the Duke uh, a, a rather um, quizzical look or two. Um, but we were going to give it, of course, uh, in, and present it in, in the museum collection. So he understood the rationale, but found it a, a rather peculiar request of ours <laughs> to retain the gift of his wife. He was quite a character, wasn't he? He was. He had a, an incredible intensity about him. Um, you know, you come in, he had this great military bearing, as you might imagine, uh, very erect, very correct. You know, he would ask very, very sharp, very perceptive uh, questions about what we were doing, how we were trying to achieve what we wished to achieve. He was all for detailed uh, engagement. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a, a passing moment. Far from it. Nick Bull with his memories there of uh, one occasion that he met the Duke of Edinburgh. Prince Philip carried out more than 22,000 solo engagements in his seven decades of public service. As a military man himself, he enjoyed visits to Catterick Garrison, where he presented medals to troops that had returned from Afghanistan. He was also a regular visitor at the Great Yorkshire Show. Olivia Richwold has been speaking to Joe Ropner, Her Majesty's Lord Lieutenant of North Yorkshire, about his legacy. Prince Philip was a hugely charismatic man and he will be remembered across North Yorkshire. He was well respected and well loved by everybody. He always brought that little bit extra to those visits. Prince Philip made so many visits here to North Yorkshire in 70 years of public service, including for the 150th anniversary of the Great Yorkshire Show. Can you tell me about some of the other notable visits he made to North Yorkshire? There were some notable visits. Um, he came up with the Queen certainly on several occasions. One was to reopen the Scarborough Open Air Theatre and I think there were six and a half thousand people um, lining the streets and they walked back to their cars with rapturous clapping going on. There was also another um, lovely moment when the Prince came up with the Queen to do the Maundy money at the Minster at York and after the service the prince went down one side of the street and the queen went the other side and the prince could immediately see how disappointed one small child was because she had a little bunch of flowers. So he lifted her up and popped her over the crash barrier and said, now you give those to the queen. And so she potted across the road, gave them to the queen and I think that just sums him up. He was very thoughtful and he was such an extraordinary support to the queen, always looking out for her, always making sure that she was all right and that um, there was nothing else that he could do. No, he was an exceptional man. Another lovely story there. One of the Duke of Edinburgh's most cherished pastimes was carriage driving. An equestrian sport he pioneered involving driving a vehicle, being pulled along by a single horse, a pair or a team of four. Earlier I spoke to Jane Wilson, who met the Duke on a number of times while competing. My um, husband and myself, um, take part in competition carriage driving, uh, which, as I think everybody knows, uh, was a great love of the Duke of Edinburgh's. So in the days when he was still competing, we would often meet up with him at various events around the country. Um, and so, uh, you know, as you would have to be involved in walking obstacles so that you knew where you were going when you got there, you would often um, bump into him on that basis. Um, and of course, when he was involved in carriage driving, he was doing something he absolutely loved and it took him, I guess, away from the pressures of 
of royal responsibility. So, so he was always at a carriage driving event doing something he absolutely wanted to do. And what um, was he like, Jane? Well, he, he was took his sport very seriously. Um, always wanted to do um, the best that he could um, to um, to succeed in the sport, but he was never um, so busy doing it and so involved in it that he wouldn't be willing to give, say, for instance, a novice driver the benefit of some of his advice. Uh, and what did and, his passion for carriage driving do for the sport, do you think, Jane? Oh, I can't begin to tell you. Um, he was responsible for drafting the first ever set of international rules for the sport back in the 70s. But the sport grew from there and now all sorts of people from all sorts of walks of life take part in it. I, I can't even begin to think of how much the sport is going to miss him now he's not here anymore. And, um, and how will it, you best remember Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh? Well, we, we were lucky enough to, on two occasions, be invited to a reception in the house at Sandringham when we were competing there. I remembered that he judged dressage on that particular occasion, so I felt that's a safe subject. So when he got to us, I asked him, so did you enjoy judging dressage today? And he immediately said, no, I didn't. <laughs> I thought, oh, I've obviously asked the wrong question. He said, the trouble is with judging dressage, you end up with only one person who's your friend and everybody else is your enemy. <laughs> Which I thought was a, an interesting take on the fact that only one person can win and everybody else uh, is a loser. Um, so he was always approachable. He was just a nice chap to have around. And that good sense of humour is something that keeps coming through, isn't it, with uh, all these wonderful memories. Speaking of memories, you may remember in 2014, Yorkshire County Cricket Club were crowned champions and invited to Buckingham Palace to be formally presented with their medals by the Duke of Edinburgh. Their captain at the time was Andrew Gale, who is now the side's first team coach. Our reporter Paul Ogden has been back to the club today to get their reaction. Day two of Yorkshire's match against Glamorgan was given some perspective by today's news from Buckingham Palace. The white rose flag fluttering at half-mast in memory of His Royal Highness Duke of Edinburgh, with whom the county's cricketers will always proudly share a bond. County champions two years running in 2014 and 2015, Captain Andrew Gale, now the team's head coach, took his players to Buckingham Palace to personally receive their trophies from Prince Philip. What was overwhelming for us was how relaxed they made us feel. You know, the lads were a bit nervous about going down. I remember being briefed uh, before meeting him by his people how I should approach him, and they said, just bow your head, don't shake his hand. And I went up to meet him, and I bowed my head, and he put his hand out and shook it. So it sort of put me at ease straight away. The lads had a, a bit of a giggle about that. But, yeah, sad day. Your impression of him as a person? Could you have a conversation with him while you were there? Yeah, we went down with all our wives and girlfriends as well and he took the time out of his day, which will have been a very, very busy schedule, to go around and, and talk to everyone in the room, really. Uh, and it was a nice moment for us all to, to meet him. And, you know, he asked questions about how many players had come through the academy, how many games we won. So to take that time out was, was a massive thing, really. I shall miss him as a friend uh, because he was close, a close friend of mine uh, and I shall miss him. And uh, it's very, very sad that he hasn't made a century, 100 not out, would have been wonderful for him. Another crucial cricketing connection was Prince Philip's role as patron of the Lord's Taverners, the UK's leading charity for young cricketers and disability sports. The number of minibuses you see around with Lord's Taverners on the side, and he was a patron of that, and raised a lot of money for, for that foundation and charity, so he'll be sadly missed from that. And, and to meet him as well and to be presented with the county championship trophy will go down long in our memory. Yeah, it certainly was a wonderful day. Uh, Abby's here now with the, the latest forecast and I believe you did the Duke of Edinburgh. You did all three, didn't you? I did, yes. Bronze, silver and gold. Well no done. way I'd be where I was doing this job for sure without that. So wonderful memories. And if you are perhaps going out on your Duke of Edinburgh weekend, one of your expedition weekends this weekend, it's going to be very chilly. It's turning much colder. We're entering into this cold Arctic air mass once again. So temperatures will be below the seasonal average for the time of year over the next couple of days. Bit of a mix of sunny spells and scattered 
showers tomorrow. Given the drop in temperatures, some of the showers might be a little bit wintry, but they will be mixed in with some really decent spells of sunshine. We're also pulling in this very chilly northeasterly wind that will affect the temperatures, particularly along the coast, but even inland it'll feel cold in exposure of that. And then a bit of a battle during the week next week between high and low pressure. We'll have high pressure in the south, low pressure out to the north, so we might see a little bit of uh, rain, maybe a few showers from that area of low pressure, but I think largely it looks at the moment so the high pressure will win out. So a lot of settle weather next week, a lot of dry weather, and actually the temperatures do look set to rise. Looking at the satellite then from earlier today, we've seen a lot of cloud, a very stubborn, slow-moving weather front across South Yorkshire and North Derbyshire. Elsewhere, though, we have seen brighter skies. I think gradually as we head through to the overnight period, we will see lengthier clear spells developing, but still a scattering of showers, and given the drop in temperatures, dropping well below freezing quite widely, I think we are at risk of seeing some of those showers turn wintry, even down to lower levels. It's a very cold start to the day tomorrow. High waters then, we're looking at 4.46 in Bridlington and then again at 4.50 in the afternoon. So it's going to be a really cold start to the day tomorrow. Cold, frosty, but dry and bright for most initially. However, we'll then see these showers starting to develop and they will really pep up. Some of them are going to be quite heavy. And once again, even down to lower levels, they might be a little bit wintry. Temperatures reaching around 7 or 8 Celsius, but you can see along the coast it's going to be even colder. Highs here of just 4 or 5 degrees. And of course, if we factor in the wind chill, this is what it will feel like if you're heading out tomorrow. So bitterly cold temperatures well below the seasonal average for the time of year. Quite a similar forecast through the day on Sunday, largely dry. There will be some good spells of sunshine, but we are just at risk, I think, of seeing a couple of isolated showers. Again, temperatures staying in the single figures, highs of just six or seven degrees. The winds again affecting things, making it feel even colder. But into the start of next week, we'll see this gradual rise. And if that high pressure that I showed you earlier in the south winds out, it does look largely dry and settled. Quite a lot of cloud, but with those temperatures recovering, we should be back to near normal during the middle part of the week, Amy. Thank you, Abby. Nice to see the sunshine back on the way again. Well, we end tonight's programme by paying tribute to His Royal Highness, the Duke of Edinburgh, who has died at the age of 99 after seven decades of public service. He visited Yorkshire on many occasions during that time, so we leave you tonight with some of those memories. Good night. He's a man that, for me, I almost am going to be missing a, a brother. I'm going to miss somebody who had this amazing sense of humor. We now pay particular attention because we're going to see the world's most experienced pluck on them. Somebody who's really been a great servant uh, of this nation, of the Commonwealth, and particularly towards young people with his wonderful award. I can only hope that uh, all of you here are getting something from the extra activities. Uh, in all that time out of school when you've got nothing to do, uh, <laughs> that's really what it was intended to fill. The Duke of Edinburgh is somebody who's been such a towering figure in our national life for as long as most of us can remember life lived to the full, a man who was full of the zest for life, a man who was interested in so many things and so interesting to be with. <laughs>